quarterback, Jack Kemp, who became a senator and then became federal housing commissioner. Jack Kemp and Ronald Reagan, their, scheme, their idea was to completely get the government out of housing and privatize everything. And I know this because uh, my, the partnerships that I was involved in, we were the first people to hear about this, and some of my people I worked with were getting calls from Jack Kemp every day. And people don't understand, don't know, that Jack Kemp, who described himself as a bleeding heart conservative, is the man who invented the word NIMBY. Now you have to ask yourself, why would a conservative Republican issue a report that said local control is an impediment to affordable housing? The answer was that at that time, the cost to entitle land in most states because of the environmental laws of the 70s was so expensive and took so long that all Jack Kemp's developer buddies were saying, they got to do something. And they weren't going to put federal money into it, and they weren't going to help anybody out, and they wanted to get big developers solvent, so they said, let's get rid of local government. And that's where this started. And I know this because some of the people I work with, one guy who was the ambassador to Switzerland was talking to Jack Kemp every week. This is their scheme, low-income housing tax credit. Now, low-income housing tax credits privatize finance, but the benefits predominantly go to big development and big developers. And today, they go exclusively to big developers and big development. Um, this is a way where you can actually, and I, I did this, I admit it, uh, I went into a closing with no money, um, I didn't even own the property, I walked out of the closing two hours later with a check for $2 million from my partners. The property was already bought and sold. The management was with somebody else. And that was the system. There's no incentive for the person building it to really care about the property. Now, we did manage our own properties, and we did care about them, and it cost us double what it was. We, we thought it was going to cost, but we kept them going. Anyway, Reagan launched a thing called Market Solve Everything, which didn't exactly work. And um, we have an era that I call field dri uh, fee driven deal junkies run amok, which is if you had a heartbeat, you got a mortgage. And that led to the phenomenon that in 2007, in California, 40% of all the new jobs created were development related. That means what you buy at Home Depot, and that means mortgage brokers, that means um, people building houses, everything. It's completely out of whack, completely crazy. But you know, debt-driven economics, it's a lot of fun. So everybody had a great time until they didn't have a great time. The thing we should have learned out of that was that housing plus retail without jobs first equals bankruptcy. And that's what happened to Vallejo, Modesto, Stockton, San Bernardino, and there's a whole bunch of other cities on that list waiting to put their name down. But why fix anything if you can keep the game going? So this is what they come up with. This is the One Bay Area Plan, the Transportation Oriented Development. And again, not about affordable housing, it's about development in general. Now this is a magical place. Everybody has a balloon. <laughs> it never rains. You never have to go to Home Depot and buy anything heavy. You don't have to own a pickup truck. You never have to drive six kids to soccer. This is what's called top-down, one-size-fits-all planning. You can live in the Bay Area for about eight minutes and know that one size fits all is probably the worst description for San Francisco Bay Area. So we have this plan called Plan Bay Area. The Environmental Impact Report is coming out on it. And one of the key architects behind it is Senator Daryl Steinberg. And if you go on the internet and look up who backs Daryl Steinberg, it is virtually who's who in big finance, big development, big construction. So once again, Plan Bay Area is not an affordable housing plan. It is an, it's a high density transportation near development plan. 
The regional housing needs assessment is a quota we're given. And the connections are that SB 375 connects the allocation to affordable housing. And fundamentally, it's much more profitable to build and manage big projects than it is small, infill, mixed use projects, which I'm going to argue are much more appropriate in most places. Then we have, so we have SB 375, which is essentially smart growth, tying affordable to that. And then we have what I call the greatest marketing line ever, which is 375. It says that more high density growth is good for the environment. Now, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. <laughs> I've been an environmentalist for, since 1968, when I started giving five dollars to Environmental Defense Fund, I've read more environmental science than I care to admit. I gave this talk to the old guys at the Marine Breakfast Club, and I said, the only marketing line I've ever heard better than this is for an erection lasting more than four hours, call your doctor. <laughs> I didn't know that was a problem. The old guys agreed with me. Here's the reality in Marin. This is, with or without transportation, it's driving, 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 because that is the geography we are given. All of these things you see up here, deliveries, shuttle vans, workmen, contractors, home services, utilities, fire, police, health, lessons, soccer, school, friends, vacations, buying big things, shopping, price, like going to Target or whatever, having a busy life. Or going to a doctor because you want that doctor, not because he lives next door or he's in your building. This is a reality. There's an analysis of this in my book, a whole chapter on why we can't cut down driving by building smart trains. And here's just plain reality. This is a fact. People do not choose to live in the same place, they, the same way they choose to work. People choose to live based on the place they can afford, the lifestyle, what they want for their children and their family, schools and things like that, and they tend to stay put. People work where the work is, and they're changing their jobs more often than ever. And if, we, if, if people are going to be upwardly mobile, that's a good thing. So the idea that you build housing for people that work somewhere, they don't work there for more than two and a half years on average, or three years. The other thing that's ironic about all this is New York City should be the poster child for high density development near public transportation. I lived in Manhattan for years. I never owned a car. I, I could get 18 ways to get somewhere. But the reality is per capita, that means per person, Manhattan is one of the highest GHG producers on the planet. And the reason is, two reasons. It's what's called environmental externalities. The effects it have reach hundreds of miles around it. Whereas in Marin, we have a balance between development and nature, and there's a trade-off on all kinds of things, especially greenhouse gases. The other thing is a physics phenomenon called heat islands and cold sinks, which means simply that when all that stone and concrete and steel gets cold, it's really cold. And when it gets hot, it's really hot. It takes a lot more energy to bring it back into its comfort zone. When you're an architect and you design an office building, in the winter time, you're heating the outside of the building and air conditioning the inside of the building simultaneously. So transit-oriented development, this is a 100-year-old idea. My question is, is this the vision that everyone wants from a rip? And my question as an environmentalist and as an architect is, is this really more sustainable? Because 21st century technology and 21st century environmental thinking is you solve it at the source. You no longer support big infrastructure. What you do is you say, wait a minute, I can make energy at my house. I can recycle and reuse water at my building. I can, I can capture water. I can have wind. I can have urban farming. You see how big urban farming is becoming? That was considered heresy 20 years ago. It's now a major source of food. And where are the incentives for individuals and small businesses to do this? The answer is there are really none compared to big development. In 1990, I was a benefactor of the Environmental Defense Fund. 
That means if you give them enough money, they invite you to fancy parties. So I went to a uh, symposium for three days in Washington, D.C., and one of the things that happened is we sat, 30 of us sat with Al Gore, and he gave us a presentation that became a convenient truth. He showed us all these slides, and when he was done, I raised my hand, and I said, Al, I've got a problem. I said, my problem is I love my car, and I'm not giving it up. I said, but to tell me that we have to completely re-engineer society based on my car is like telling me we have to re-engineer society because of my washing machine. It's just an appliance. Make a better appliance. And the reality is, we can easily do that. All the technology existed then, 20 years ago, it exists now, and it's even better. You know, General Motors sued the state of California to not raise the CAFE standard every day until it went bankrupt. That's the mindset that we're dealing with, the auto companies. But we can make cars that are zero emissions. There's a lot of them out on the road. We can have, uh, I mean, it, it, the taxi companies in Oakland are now doing apps on your phone that are all computerized and the taxi driver doesn't even have to look for a fare. It's all routed by computer based on people selecting they need a taxi on their phone. We can do this, we can have all kinds of flexible transportation. And one of the things Al Gore is famous for saying is denial ain't just the river in Egypt. And when it comes to personal transportation, this is actually the direction we're going. There are literally tens of thousands of technologies being invented to make personal transportation vehicles that are 100% recyclable and alternatively fueled, getting us off gas. This is where transportation is going. We're still going to have cars of different kinds of transportation vehicles. We're still going to need roads. It's not a black and white conversation. It's a very complicated thing. Now, I'm not against mass transit. I'm 100% for mass transit, but I'm not in agreement that we put all our eggs in that basket and put all our money into things like the smart train. We need both. So what we have instead is what I consider to be misguided legislation based on faulty logic. We have SB 375 that says that it will reduce greenhouse gases. And as I say, I spend a whole chapter deconstructing the facts of that. And I've talked to environmental scientists there is absolutely no evidence that that will happen. The other thing that SB 375 does that's, I think, very unfortunate is it reverses what's called the burden of proof that's been in place since the Magna Carta, which says that if it, the developer can now, if he has a qualifying project, and this is the law, he can come into your city, he can identify a property, put an option on it, and he can sue the city for that zoning on that property. And the city has to defend itself in court, where historically the developer had to come to the city or the state and say why his proposal was good. The burden of proof is shifted. I don't think it's a good way to go. We have SB 226 legislation that says in certain instances there's no environmental review for infill projects. We have a um, proposal out now to revise CEQA, so there's what's called ministerial review, which means that the public process is completely eliminated for certain kinds of projects. You don't know about it, you have no say in it. And I think every community should always have a say. I realize it's burdensome sometimes. People don't always agree. I believe we need that. So how do you fund all this development? Well, the answer that consistently is coming down is regressive taxes on the people that are most in need and on the poor. That's how they've been intended to, to finance it. SB 1220 was proposed last year, a $75 per document transaction tax on every document recorded that's real estate related in every county in California to create a billion dollar slush fund in Sacramento with no safeguards whatsoever. SB1, proposed by Daryl Steinberg, is a similar idea. It's his new version. He wants cities to dedicate a percentage of their tax revenues to a community's investment authority, who runs the authority, nobody says, um, and we all know how much extra money our cities have. MTC is going to propose that we raise gasoline taxes, probably the most regressive tax possible on the pool, to pay for all this wonderful transit-oriented development. 
They're talking about what they're calling the fiscalization of land use, which is a euphemism for repealing portion of Proposition 13. It is potentially a large business increased tax on businesses and, and possibly for elderly people who can least afford it. They are proposing, last year they proposed a tax that said that everybody had to, be, was, had to, by law, go out and buy a GPS device, have it installed in their car, and the government would watch you 24-7 where you drove and charge you 10 cents a mile. I decided that the only saving grace in this was that so many people are having affairs that the, this would never pass. Of course, the politicians will exempt themselves and that will reduce the number of people cheating by half. So this brings us to what I call bureaucrats gone wild, which is subverted public process based on law and assumption. This is the actual graph of job and population growth going up to the orange line. And what it shows is that in the last 20 years in Marin, we have on average had no population growth and no job growth. Now based on that fact, the last 20 years were the biggest boom in the history of this country. And based on that fact, now that that boom's over, ABEG is saying that the line from here now just keeps going straight up, even though it's been nothing. Now the only time you'll ever see a chart that looks like that is from your stockbroker when he's trying to sell you a useless company. So this is what the Department of Finance says. They say no growth for 20 years, till 2025, sorry, and then slightly to growth. And the law says, the housing law is clear, that the Department of Finance is the arbiter of what the proper projections are. Not ABEG, not HCD, and I'm sorry, but they're not paying attention to that. My question to all of this is, are we solving the problem? The problem is housing for existing residents who are most in need, or any residents. And when I say existing, I don't want that to be misinterpreted. That means in the Bay Area, that means people who could potentially use it, not someone moving in from Arizona, which is fine if they do. These are the kinds of housing we tend to need in Marin, and we need a lot of them. We need low-income units within existing communities, not disrupting communities, but within those communities. We need to see senior and assistant, because demographically we're going off the chart. Disability special needs, shelters. We need live work opportunities, because there's a lot of people that would prefer that. We need apartment building preservation and substantial rehabilitation, which we have very little of, because guess what? There's no money. We need building conversions. We need sweat equity. The law now says that we take a unit and build it, and we deed restrict it for 40 years, so that somebody who's low income buys it, and guess what they get for all their work? Nothing. They don't get to participate in appreciation. This is indentured servitude. I mean, the reason you buy you, you try to buy a home is so you can, uh, you can enjoy the appreciation and your hard work. If you buy an unfinished property, you can finish it. I bought a house that was abandoned when I moved here. It was all I could afford. I fixed it up, and now I have a house. And I can enjoy it. If you told me it was deep restricted, it would still be abandoned. We need second units. We, excuse me, we need... Uh, Family home, we need homes for what I call active elderly. People don't turn 65 and go to a rest home. They, yeah. And the question is, using ABEX process, how many of these are in building? And the answer is almost none of them. They don't recognize hardly any of them as counting in these quotas. So where are the funding programs to improve what, and maintain what we have? The answer is there are none. Why is that? And what are we getting instead? What we're getting is projects like these. Mill Valley, same thing. We have a project in Mill Valley, supposed to be low income, affordable. It's 24 units. 18 of the units are a million and a half dollar condos. Four of the units are market rate regular properties, or the high six, six figures. We have two, two units in it that are from 80% median income, which in Mill Valley means 90,000 a year in income, that's considered low income. 
And we have two units that are actually low income. That's not going to do it. Now we have properties like San Clemente Place, which is all affordable, but it has real estate tax exemptions. There's a problem with that. I talked with the city of Corte Madera, and San Clemente Place has a much higher service cost for the city than a regular market rate property because of its density and because of the way it's set up. And Barbara Fazio, the mayor of ex-mayor of Puerto Madero, got up the other night and he said at a meeting I was at, he said, how does this work? I mean, we have tax exemptions and credits and density bonuses and subsidies for big development that produces an overly great impact on our schools and our infrastructure and services. You, Marina has very unique water issues. We don't have unlimited water and it's getting expensive. If you look at your water bill every year, it goes up 20%. Unfortunately, math is math. You can't keep doing this. And we can't print money like the feds can. If we could print money, we could get out of it the same way. But we can't have more and more of our revenues go to the state and not come back, and then have more and more un unfunded demands and unsustainable development built where we are. Just, it just doesn't work. So, I say top-down doesn't work because we now live in a bottom-up world. Gavin Newsom just wrote an interesting book about that called Citizenville. I think you should read it. He says that the world has changed and the government, actually he actually said the government is state-of-the-art 1973. The government is not recognizing the need to interface local voices with the top and have that be constant. So how can we do this better? So my answer is that instead of going around and paying a consultant $650,000 to drive around in a nice car and pick out sites and say, those are great, we should build housing there, distorting the market, picking ridiculous sites that don't make sense, why don't we do this? Why doesn't every community be able to make its own criteria of what they want? Because of low-income housing and how they want to solve it. So some may favor more renovation. Some may favor more re more adding on. Some may want new buildings. Some may want high density skyscrapers. It's okay with me. But so you have a list. Every community puts together public policy. This is completely non-existent now. Public policy ideas. So these are some of them, you know, economically obsolete, underutilized, hazardous. Maybe do you want a lot of green technology in your community, green building or some amenities or enhancing appropriate scale. Then you, let, you have the incentives and you let the market be creative and compete for those subsidies, not just hand them to it, because they're good at filling out forms. When I was a formal housing developer, we had a guy on our team that's all he did is fill out forms. It's hard to do without it. And we need real science, not politicized science. SB 375 is just wrong. Growth is an endless feedback loop. More is always more. Because the minute you have more of anything, you need more of everything else. More people create more services, consumption, stores, employees, shipping, trucking, capacity, resources, water, sewage, upkeep, repair, power, you name it. Everything ends up more. And so unless we understand that, it's a hazardous way to go. And even before we do anything, we've got to understand what buildings mean. Buildings on the earth use 40% of our energy just sitting there. And building buildings is the most resource intensive thing we do on the planet. And it affects ecosystems around the world, it affects indigenous people around the world, it affects everything. And China has adopted what we're doing very well. So my message is it's time to slow down and think about what we're doing. We're using 100 year old construction techniques I think that we need to start doing things differently to come up with truly sustainable solutions. We have a thing called lead standards. It's good, it's not enough. There's an idea called cradle to cradle. It means that everybody who manufactures something has to take it back when you're done with it. They passed this law in Germany and within one year, BMWs and washing machines had 25% fewer parts, the price didn't change, and they were 100% recycled. We don't have that in this country. Just passing a simple wall. Think of the impact, global impact, local impact. 
This is the Ames Research Center. This is done by an architect named William McDonough, who's truly a genius of our time. This development is like a plant. It actually produces more oxygen than carbon. It recycles all its water and waste on the site. It's just like a real plant. If we can build like this, we can talk about massive growth. So I want to find out how can we preserve what we have and solve our growth and our housing needs. What I want to do is solve the problem. And here's the problem in Marin. The vast majority of our real housing opportunities are smaller, appropriate, infill, mixed-use, rehab, or conversion sites, and they're owned by individuals and small businesses, and where are the tax credits and the exemptions and the subsidies and incentives for them? The answer is there are none. So our cities are handcuffed. And there's a lot of city council I've talked to that say, absolutely, we would love to. I've gone to city managers around the county and said, what would you do if I brought you 20 or 30 million dollars for affordable housing? They all have 100 ideas. They don't have five dollars to do that. So why don't we take all the subsidies that we're giving the top and cut them down and increase the subsidies to people in need, like vouchers, which I think there should be more of, increase subsidies at the local level, give our cities some money and let them figure out how to do it. I think we'll get better results. Now people have said to me, I've read, oh, there's a conspiracy, this or that, it's worse. I work with the government all the way to Washington, D.C., and I can tell you without a doubt they couldn't conspire to have lunch. <laughs> what we have is we have a problem where we have all these unaccountable, unelected agency staff in an enormous number of agencies. They are aggressively, aggressively interpreting regulations, and I have read the responses from HCD to towns around, and they are making it up. There's no basis in law. I've read the housing law. I've read the legislation. It's just not there. And they're using our money to push what I consider to be outdated, ideological, non-scientific agendas that none of us voted for. Not us or our representatives. We're in this together. This is a perfect storm. We have a busted economy. We have what I call starry-eyed young regional planners. We have outdated 1970s environmental thinking. Because believe me, we've moved way past the old know anything thinking. We have unsupervised growth agencies that have budgets in the tens of millions of dollars a year enforcing misguided legislation by what I believe are Sacramento politicians desperate to regenerate revenues and all of this is backed by big finance, big banking, big development and that means a loss of local control as I define it which means your voice and the voice of the people who are outside and everybody else included and it leads to bad solutions. I want to ask you about social justice. Is it just to warehouse economically disadvantaged people in high density projects next to highways? I mean, my, my family when I grew up was in Harlem. And, if, and they were Italian. If you told them that you're going to take them out of Harlem, which didn't look all that great, and put them in high density next to the highway, they would look like you looked at you like you came from another planet. They lived in a community. They would have said, why would I leave a place where I have people that know me, that share my culture, that share my food, my language, that are my friends, that I can borrow tools from, that I can do things with? Why would I want to go do that? It's a recipe for social disaster. And what's better, to segregate people in stigmatized low-income projects, or to find ways and develop programs to integrate and welcome everyone into every existing community and let them make their own choices. Some of the ways we might be able to do that, how about raising the minimum wage? What a concept. You know that, that multinational corporations, and this is where it all connects, offshore trillions of dollars in profits this year to not have to pay U.S. taxes. All of Apple's profits 
of profits they didn't pay any taxes on, so they paid no U.S. taxes. And GE lobbied against raising the minimum wage because they said they can't afford it. And guess what? GE is a big buyer of low-income housing tax credits. Connect the dots. And how about free medical care for everybody in this country, like every other civilized country? You get sick in France, they take care of you. You get, you get sick in Costa Rica, they take care of you and don't give you a and how about, our free, how about free education through college for every U.S. citizen? You know what that would cost us? That would cost us 15% of our defense budget. That's just $800 toilet seats and hammers. We can afford that. I think it's time for new ideas. I think it's time to do things in new ways. And I think it's time for new leadership. Thank you very much for listening.